No, thanks. I'm not a coffee drinker. So have you had anyone else from National Labs speak? Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Life After Jilla. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we're really excited to have David Osborne with us today. Uh, just to let you know that the talk is being recorded, uh, although we'll turn off the recording for your uh, student questions at the end, so your questions won't be recorded. Uh, David Osborne uh, got his uh, PhD in physical chemistry from UC Berkeley. Uh, and then he did a postdoc here at Chile with uh, Steve Leone. Uh, he's been working at Sandia National Laboratory for over 20 years, and it has also spent several years as an adjunct professor at UC Davis. Um, so if you'd like to give him a warm welcome, <laughs> thank you. Make sure the I think the microphone is on. You can hear me through the speakers. Good. Okay, well, thank you very much for the invitation to come here. Uh, feel free to interrupt. I will tell you a little bit about my history and, uh, and then about careers at National Labs and some other things I hope you'll find helpful. But first, a little uh, bonus point. Can anyone identify this uh, place in Colorado? Anyone? <laughs> yeah, okay. Good point. I didn't go there when I was a postdoc here either. This is Telluride, uh, another little locus of scientific activity in, uh, in Colorado. Okay, so I'm from Sandia National Laboratories, and hopefully I'll be able to advance this slide soon. Doesn't seem to be working at the moment. Hmm. Let me disconnect this and reconnect. That's a good sound. Hmm. Let me see. Let me end the slideshow and restart it. Let's see if that. There we go. Okay. So a bit about my background. Uh, I wanna make sure we cover what national laboratories are, what careers are like in them. A little bit about the United States Department of Energy, which, which runs national laboratories. Uh, and then some things about career trade-offs and especially funding, 
which is important in research. And some of these funding points maybe are not obvious. So I wanna make sure to cover them. They weren't obvious to me. <clears throat> okay, so I got my Bachelor of Science at the University of Chicago and was lucky enough to work there with Don Levy, the first person to do spectroscopy and supersonic jets and noticed that that could cool down the internal degrees of freedom of a molecule and therefore provide very useful simplification and insight into molecular spectroscopy. I went on then to do a PhD in physical chemistry at the University of California in Berkeley, uh, and then a postdoc here for a couple of years. Uh, and since then I've been at what's called the Combustion Research Facility, but in the same way JILA is no longer the Joint Institute for Laboratory Astrophysics, we don't emphasize combustion so much anymore. Uh, and a few years ago, I also became an adjunct professor, but in chemical engineering. Uh, and I've done a number of other things. Uh, I certainly took advantage of some of the great climbing here in Boulder uh, while I was here. Beautiful for that. I would say a core theme in my career, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about the things I'm interested in. So especially if you're a physical chemist, I hope this will resonate. If not, I think you may find some links to other things that are done in Jilla and other parts. Uh, a core theme I would say would be the scientific impact of multiplexing, of asking the question, what can we learn about a, a system, in my case, usually molecules, if we collect as many observables as possible simultaneously? And so the thing that attracted me to Dan Newmark's group, and he was actually a postdoc here also at Jilla in Carl Leinberger's group, the thing that attracted me to this experiment, which is called the fast radical beam machine that was essentially just constructed, but hadn't really produced any useful data when I was a graduate student beginning in 1991, was the idea that you could uh, make a free radical, so a molecule with an unpaired electron, and then have it absorb a photon and break into two parts and measure the full three-dimensional recoil vector of how those two uh, parts were coming away from each other and really do it one at a time. So measure in the case of CH3O, if that's the radical you wanted to study, you'd break it apart and measure the CH3 radical and the O atom in coincidence. So those two single species, one at a time. And you do this many, many times to build up statistics and from that, you can learn uh, very basic things like uh, the bond energy. So the core of my thesis was then to, I, I thought it would be useful to have a chemical theme to this, to look at the simplest radicals that have carbon and oxygen and are sp, sp2, and sp3 hybridized. So there you can see those three, and I succeeded in making them all and uh, dissociating them. The real link back to Jilla is that in order to make a free radical, of course, they're stable, but they're really chemically reactive. Whenever they run into anything else, they become some other molecule, typically. The key to making them was something that started with Carl Leinberger here at Jilla, of first forming a negative ion. And because it's a free radical with an unpaired electron, you can always drop another electron into that orbital, completely fill it, and that's a nice stable negative ion species. The negative ions you can mass select and accelerate and then detach the negative ion here, get rid of the electron. And now you have a cold, clean, high speed free radical that you can break apart. So in doing so, you can, you can measure a lot about photo dissociation dynamics. Here's some of our data from that where just from the translational energy or the speed we measured of these two the CH3 moving away from the O atom, you can resolve structure. And this turns out to be the umbrella mode of the CH3 radical uh, that is excited as, as the O atom leaves. And from that, we measured things like uh, the dissociation mechanism and most importantly, the bond strength, which is important in thermodynamics. And there's Dan's smiling face. Uh, so when I came here, I had the idea I should really do something different. And boy, was it different. Uh, Steve Leone had a project in near field scanning optical microscopy. And our hope was to do sub diffraction limit imaging of molecules or other objects on surfaces. 
uh, with pump probe time resolution. Turns out that's a really hard experiment. A few people have managed to do it, but boy, it's not easy. Uh, and so among other things I looked at while I was in the Leone group was uh, defects on semiconductors where in topography, this uh, it's a type of scanning probe uh, microscopy. And so in addition to optical information, you can get information on the topography of the surface. Where we would find depressions, we found uh, much, much higher photocurrent generation. And so those are uh, not subdiffraction limited, but told you interesting things about uh, the particle physics of that. And, and so while I was here, I learned a lot from the electronic shop people, from Terry Brown, who I guess is still here. I looked for him today, couldn't find him yet, but uh, about feedback loops and lots of other great things that I was just never exposed to at UC Berkeley. So I'm incredibly grateful for the chance I had to be at Jilla. Um, once I took off on my own at Sandia, not surprisingly, I, I took some of the things I learned both at Berkeley and here at Jilla and tried to put my own spin on them. So one thing from Jilla was time-resolved Fourier spectroscopy, which I did some of. Sorry, that's, yeah, that's from Steve Leone's group. And then we did some work with nice ohms, a very ultra-sensitive detection of marrying frequency modulation spectroscopy with cavity enhancement that Jun Yi worked on in his graduate career here with Jan Hall. Uh, another very hard experiment, which we don't do anymore. <laughs> uh, and then I also developed multiplex photoionization mass spectrometry. So I'll tell you a bit more about that. Um, but this first experiment I did uh, when I started out on my own was to try to take infrared spectroscopy which is a really beautiful diagnostic for getting fingerprints of molecules and, and separating, say, HCN from HNC. Same atoms, different isomers, but of course their vibrational frequencies are very different. And so there's hardly a better technique than infrared spectroscopy for selectivity. Uh, so here was a, a reaction we studied, but I didn't just want to study static molecules. So this is HCCO. It's one of the free radicals I worked on in graduate school and recorded the first electronic spectrum of it. When it reacts with O2, it actually makes both CO and CO2 at the same time. Uh, there was evidence for that in the literature, but most CO2 in combustion is actually made from the OH plus CO reaction. So it's sequential. First carbon monoxide is formed, and then later that becomes CO2. Here was a reaction that made them both at the same time. At least that's what people thought. Uh, and so here's a time-resolved infrared spectrum of this system. This blob down here is the uh, reactant itself that's emitting infrared light because it's formed vibrationally excited. And then as it begins to react with O2, you create CO and CO2, and it's a very exothermic reaction. So they're both vibrationally excited. They emit infrared photons. And as they collide, they cool. And when they cool because of anharmonicity, the emission frequency becomes larger. And so I like this plot because I think it shows a lot about chemical reactions moving forward and then collisional energy transfer that, that takes energy out of vibration and moves it into translation. So what we could tell chemically was if you labeled, so here's the HCCO radical and molecular oxygen, if you pay some money, about $5,000 per liter and, uh, and get pure oxygen 18. Then you could try to answer the question, when 18 adds to this carbon, it can do two things. It can either form a four-membered intermediate like this and break apart, as I've shown here, into H plus CO and CO2. Uh, but now the CO2 is always 16, 18 CO2. There's another way this could happen though, through a three-member transition state where this oxygen bonds back to the same carbon. And if that breaks apart, now the CO2 is all double 18 label and the CO is 16. So the products are the same, but the pathways are different. And this uh, interested me to try to, to see if we could tell these apart. And, and indeed you can. Turns out it's mostly the four-membered ring pathway. Um, 
Unfortunately, so infrared spectroscopy is very, very selective. It's easy to tell these different isotopes from each other, but it's not very sensitive. Uh, although I'll give the caveat, David Nesbitt's group is one place where infrared spectroscopy can be highly, highly sensitive. But in general, it's really hard to do that. Um, so I searched for another way that I could have uh, a very multiplexed experiment. And I, I tried to go back to the drawing board to think, what would the ultimate, ultimate experiment be to study chemical kinetics or reactions? Uh, what, would, what characteristics would you want? And so by thinking of that first, it led me to a different technique. So I would say, if you want to do this, you'd like a technique that is truly universal, that could detect homonuclear diatomics, free radicals, biradicals, big polycyclic aromatics, something like that. Uh, you'd want it to be sensitive, so you can do these things on very dilute samples and see minor interesting species. You would still want it to be selective. So for example, could you tell the difference between this biradical, which is a Kriege intermediate, if you follow that kind of chemistry, where the CH3 group is on the top side versus on the bottom side? So two different conformers. They ought to have a lot in common, but, but they are different. Can you tell those two apart? You'd like it to do all this simultaneously to measure all these different species at once and ideally be time resolved. So you could see the consumption of reactants, the creation of intermediates, and their further conversion into final products. And here's the chemicals of this reaction sequence. So these are all things we've done. Uh, and the approach that we have brought to this is called multiplex photoionization mass spectrometry. So this of everything I've built is probably the machine I'm, I'm most, well, I'm, I'm very proud of one we just built last year too. But, but this is the one that's kind of been the bread and butter of my career. Uh, so I don't have time to explain all the details of it, but in essence, you can run a bimolecular or a unimolecular chemical reaction, sample these neutral species through a pinhole, ionize them with tunable vacuum ultraviolet light. So you pluck off an electron from these neutrals. Once they're an ion then, that electron that leaves carries information in it as a photoelectron spectrum. And the ion itself also has uh, a mass to charge ratio. This is how we do multiplexing. So if you can measure all those mass to charge ratios simultaneously, which we do with rapid high frequency uh, time of flight mass spectrometry, you can sort out all the different product channels first by mass. You can follow them in reaction time if you initiate the reaction with a pulse laser and then have high frame rate mass spectrometry. And finally, there's a spectroscopy axis too. Uh, we do most of these experiments at the advanced light source synchrotron at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. It's a good place to get intense, tunable colors of lights. They're hard to make in the laboratory. So in our case, light from about seven to 20 electron volts up in the vacuum ultraviolet region. And in that case, the, so the value we have that replaces infrared spectroscopy and it's not as good as infrared spectroscopy, I'll tell you that, is that different isomers, because they're different molecules, have different ionization energies, the energy needed to pluck off the electron. And so by taking, by scanning the photon energy that we use to ionize molecules over a wide range, we can then in real time get uh, molecular fingerprints for every species we make. And that allows us to sort out a lot of uh, interesting chemistry. So I'll only give you a, a tiny flavor for this. This is one of these uh, Kriege intermediates, which were postulated back in the 1950s. And lots of people in Boulder and atmospheric chemistry have studied Kriege intermediates, but only very indirectly. So they, they arise when ozone, three oxygen atoms, attack alkenes, of which ethylene is the simplest. Uh, that complex breaks up. And this is these kind of molecules that look like an aldehyde. So if you're a chemist, you know this is acid aldehyde, but it's got an extra oxygen atom stuck to it. And that makes it quite reactive. Uh, so I won't go into its chemistry anymore, but just point out that there's a syn version of this where the CH3 group is on the same side as this oxygen. 
And there's what's called an antiversion, where it's on the opposite side. Uh, and because there's a partial double bond here, these don't interconvert between each other. Uh, and so we were able to make the species uh, reactive with SO2 and show that that species uh, reacts away more and more quickly as you increase the amount of SO2. But the chemically really interesting thing about this is that there were, when we started this back in about 2010, theory papers saying that when these intermediates react with water, which of course there's plenty of in the atmosphere, even here in Boulder, uh, there's about a five or 100,000 difference in the rate of reaction between sin and anti, that anti would be 100,000 times faster, all because the CH3 groups on the other side. Now, to me, that's a pretty interesting chemical hypothesis. Could that really be true? Uh, to answer that question, you not only need to be able to make these hard to make species, stabilize them so they don't go away too quickly, and then add water in known amounts uh, and be able to detect them separately. So it, it turns out this is true. Uh, uh, and we found many other reactions where anti reacts much, much faster than sin in this space. But to get that, you really need uh, highly multiplexed experiments that are highly sensitive to. So those are the kind of things that I uh, have done in my career, and there's more. I have another talk uh, at 4 p.m. tomorrow here where I'll talk about sugar formation without life, carbene chemistry. So it's a little more physical organic. Um, okay, so now I wanna break into telling you something about national laboratories. Um, they're funded by the US Department of Energy. So there are other things you might think of as, as national laboratories, and NIST would be one of them, I would say or the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. They are similar structurally, but they're not national laboratories. Uh, all the national laboratories are funded by the US Department of Energy and their origin traces back to this uh, Nobel Prize winning scientist, Ernest Orlando Lawrence, who invented the cyclotron. It was the first really good way to accelerate charged particles to very high energies. And it leads to things like uh, CERN, the experiment in uh, France and, uh, and Switzerland. So here's a, a photo of his 60 inch cyclotron from the mid 1930s, I would say. This was on the hill above the University of California at Berkeley. And the thing he brought that was, I would say, at least in the United States new at the time was multidisciplinary team scientists to succeed at building big, big complicated instruments. You need not only physicists, but engineers, chemists, electrical engineers. And that's what Lawrence, uh, who was a very good salesman in addition to being a great physicist, convinced the United States government of. And his work led to the creation of what is now called Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Originally it was called the Radiation Laboratory and the people in Berkeley didn't like that name too much, right? People get scared of radiation, but not all radiation is bad. <laughs> anyway, so the national labs though really developed because of the Manhattan Project. And I won't spend any time on the Manhattan Project. I'm sure all of you know about it, uh, but this was on a, the grandest scale, multidisciplinary team science. And so after the Manhattan Project, the Atomic Energy Commission was formed in 1946. Uh, which eventually became the Department of Energy. Uh, and so, of course, it works on atomic weapons, nuclear weapons, and maintains them to this day. That's a big part of Sandia, my laboratory's job. It's not what I work on, but it's a big part of Sandia. But what you may not know is the Department of Energy was also one of the major players in the Human Genome Project, the Global Climate Change Program, the, the national labs do a lot of things besides nuclear weapons. And that's a, a message I wanna get across to you. So there's 17 Department of Energy National Laboratories. They are all across the nation. Uh, 10 of them are called Office of Science Laboratories and they don't directly work on nuclear weapons. There are three of them that are called National Nuclear Security Administration Laboratories. 
Sandia, where I work, is one of those. And they are directly involved with nuclear weapons research, but also many, many other kinds of research related to national security. Uh, Sandia, my lab, has two main locations, mostly in Albuquerque. I'm at the Livermore site uh, near San Francisco in the Bay Area of California. All right, and, it, and I'm sure a lot of you folks know about the National Renewable Energy Lab in Golden nearby here. Um, okay, so if you were thinking about employment at a national lab, one thing you should know is that the Department of Energy Labs and the Department of Energy itself is a mission-driven organization as opposed to the National Science Foundation where they hand out money to explore curiosity-driven research and it may or may not have a mission uh, or a reason. Uh, it may just be interesting science. DOE always has a mission. And their mission here is to ensure America's security and prosperity by addressing energy, environmental, and nuclear challenges through transformative science and technology solutions. Okay, so that's what they say. Here are the top five people at DOE. And I'm quite proud that within the Biden administration, <clears throat> four of these five folks are, are uh, females. Uh, and uh, Jill Ruby was the former head of Sandia National Laboratories, the first female uh, president of Sandia, and now runs the entire National Nuclear Security Administration. And Jerry Richmond's a colleague of mine from the University of Oregon, a, a chemist who does some frequency generation. I'm sure a number of you know of her work. Um, so the DOE mission, if you work for the national labs, you need to address the mission. But the mission is unusually broad, I would say. I bet broader than, you'll, than, than, than you think of. So it's organized in three pillars, National Nuclear Security Administration, which deals primarily with nuclear weapons stewardship and emergency response. There's a lot of basic science underpinning this though. So you can imagine there's tritium in nuclear weapons. That's not a classified uh, um, piece of information. And you could imagine tritium, an unstable isotope of hydrogen, behaves quite differently than H or deuterium. So there's a lot of basic science about how tritium interacts with solids that's done at Sandia. So there's just one example of how the nuclear weapons business needs a lot of science behind it. But under science and innovation, there's a really wide, wide range of work, including the Cancer Moonshot program, lots of work in quantum computing and sensing that overlaps with interests people have here at Jilla, And under infrastructure, a lot of carbon-free electricity, uh, grid development, um, lots of national security work about how both energy and water, two big things we're worried about a lot right now, could lead to political instability uh, and that technological solutions could help maintain uh, good relations between countries. So for that, of course, you need people who are not, who hopefully have a science background in some way, but they may be policy oriented or international relations oriented. So there's a wide, wide range of people that the national laboratories employ. And 118 DOE affiliated scientists have won the Nobel Prize. So there's a very rigorous science uh, going on too, in addition to other fields that are more tangentially related to science. In addition, the Department of Energy sponsors, uh, funds a, a large range of what are called user facilities. You may or may not have ever been to one of these or know what they are, but they're basically hearkening back to Ernest Lawrence. Facilities that are so big that it's unlikely any university could fund something like this. So for instance, the advanced light source synchrotron that I do a lot of my work at at Lawrence Berkeley Lab is about a billion dollar investment to create. And it comes from the history of cyclotrons that were made there. But synchrotrons accelerate electrons to very, very close to the speed of light. And any charged particle subject to acceleration always emits radiation, fundamental law. And so this is a good way to make x-rays and vacuum ultraviolet light, soft x-rays, and so on. But it's not a, anything that you can really expect a university to build. So DOE funds lots of facilities like this around the entire nation. And one of the best parts about them is 
anyone from any country, you don't have to be in the US, can write a, a user proposal as it's called. Here's the science I wanna do at the Center for Integrated Nanotechnologies. And if it's judged highly enough, you get to use it for free. As long as you publish the information in the open literature. If you wanna do proprietary research, you have to pay for it. And you can do that too. If you're a drug company, lots and lots of drug companies pay a lot to do pro protein crystallography at these kind of uh, sites. So within DOE, lots of people are employed at these national facilities. And you, if it makes sense for your research, can, can write a proposal and do research here. So it's another great service that DOE uh, brings to the nation and that we all pay for through our tax dollars, right? Uh, a lot of job opportunities at places like this too. Uh, and one of the most common thing are uh, people who, who work on the instruments, but also help with the scientist at a place with the science. At a place like a synchrotron, these are often called beamline scientists. So if you're the kind of person who thinks, you know, I really like the science, but the thing that I enjoy the most is working with my hands, building new instruments, coming up with a solution no one else has ever built before that allows me to do something that no one else has ever been able to do. It could be that these kind of facilities offer the right job for you to be able to stay very hands-on and very innovating uh, with the instrumentation your whole career. So I wanna bring that up too. Okay, in the last few minutes here, I wanna go over some common career paths for scientists. I bet a lot of you already know this, and, and then I wanna to get to funding, which is important. So let's jump right into it. I, I artificially break this down into four areas. Uh, what could you do with a PhD in chemistry or physics? You could be a university professor, and here my example is Steve Leone. Here's a picture of his group a few years ago, 30 or so people. It was that big when he was here too. Uh, this is probably the part you are most familiar with, PhD, postdoc, assistant professor, hopefully tenure. Uh, the three parts of your job would be research, teaching, and service to the university, to the community, to world science. One of the best rewards is you're in charge. You can pursue any science you want as long as you can find the money. Uh, but you're the chief fundraiser. I mean, you need to do that finding of the money. It's all consuming, I would say, for most people. And that could be a big plus. I mean, my advisor, Steve, he, I mean, this is his life and he loves it. And he's really benefited a great number of people throughout his career. But another path is to teach at a four-year college and especially at the really good four-year colleges. And McAllister is one of them. My friend, Tom Varberg is a professor there. Uh, there, again, you have teaching, research and service, but it's much more heavily weighted on the teaching side. And a lot of people don't even do research at all. The best people do, and Tom's one of them. Again, you're the chief fundraiser, and there are some special pots of money where faculty at non-PhD granting institution compete only against other similar faculty. They're not competing against the, the David Nesbitts and the Jun Yi's of the world, right? So that's really nice. But the research resources are often kind of limited, and there's a very significant teaching load. But if you love teaching, one of these high power uh, four-year colleges could be the right place to be. And that's why Tom loves it. Okay, let's move on hopefully to the next one. National Laboratory Scientist or Engineer. So this is, this is my story. Uh, you would need a PhD and usually a postdoc, not always, but I'd say 95% of the permanent staff we hire have a postdoc. Uh, you start as a staff scientist either on your own project, but more likely on an ongoing project where someone's left or they're expanding and they need someone to join an existing project and be part of a team. You develop your expertise, build a group, but here's a big difference. You do research and you do service, but there's typically no teaching at all. So if you don't like teaching and you already know that from being a teaching assistant, this could be a, a great place to allow you to do research. Uh, I'm a journal editor. 
Uh, I run conferences. I do a lot of that kind of service. Uh, but until recently, I haven't done any teaching until I started the adjunct appointment. I really do like teaching, though. So that's one reason I took this uh, professorship appointment. There's potential for a better work-life balance. Uh, and you can enjoy hands-on science, I would say, as long as desired. Here's my colleague, Dave Chandler, who invented uh, ion imaging that later became known as velocity map imaging. Probably some of you may use that in your work. Um, there are three funding scenarios, and I'll, I'll talk about those a little bit. The trade-offs, well, you might be limited in the scope or subject areas of science, and I'll get to that a little bit more when we talk about funding. And what I called a reward of no teaching could also be a trade-off of no teaching. If that's where you get some of your fulfillment, well, you're not going to get it usually at a place like this. Okay, and then industry. Uh, Often, I mean, often they'll want a PhD, maybe not. Uh, postdocs are often discouraged. Industry may want you straight out of a PhD uh, and to train you themselves. Better work-life balance is, is likely possible. Um, funding is usually someone else's responsibility. The trade-offs could be very limited topical flexibility. Uh, I have a number of... Uh, former colleagues in industry, and the projects change pretty quickly. The research tends to be more applied because there's a bottom line and a profit that needs to be achieved at some point in the future in some companies. And job security is typically lower. People typically move around more in industry. But the, uh, the salaries can often be higher. So, all right. So let's oversimplify a bit uh, about what's involved in each one of these jobs. In universities, you need to educate people, and that's of prime importance. There's both basic and applied research happening. Typically, at, at uh, a research university like this, the individual investigators work you know, mostly on their own with their graduate students and postdocs. There are collaborations, of course, but you earn tenure largely on what you have done yourself along with your group. In national laboratories, basic and applied research, education is not a function, although we do mentor graduate students, uh, sorry, uh, postdocs, postdocs and some graduate students. But there's a much bigger focus on team science and engineering. And definitely it's a plus to collaborate with lots of people. Uh, and that is not in any way a negative. There's usually very good job security. Now, tenure in principle is the very best job security uh, and allows you academic freedom to do what you want once you have that tenure. And in industry, as I said, applied research, typically proprietary. You may not be able to talk about it too much. It's usually a team approach and I would say the least job security. So let's talk about funding. So this may be obvious to some of you, but to me it wasn't. So I want to point it out for anyone that doesn't, who, who doesn't uh, already know this. At a university, your salary is covered by the university. And it's because you do teaching, mentoring, and service for the university. So you don't have to raise that money every year from your grants. And instead the grants, and maybe some university help, a startup package when you're new, will pay for your research. And you need to write these grants, but they don't have to pay for your own salary. They pay for your students and postdocs. And the students especially can be relatively inexpensive because the student, graduate students are getting another benefit of learning a lot, right? Uh, so large groups tend to be common. Remember that picture of Steve Leone's group. In industry, your salary is paid by the company. Your research is paid by the company. Everything's paid by the company. Uh, and so postdocs really aren't that common. Um, if we move to national labs then, here's a big difference. The grants you write, uh, or the grants in general, you may not write them, they pay for everything, including your salary. And that uh, is a big difference. You have to raise the money to fund yourself in addition to your whole group. That tends to lead to, to mean large groups are not so common. Okay. Uh, so breaking down just national laboratories, because I want to get across how they work, and then I'm almost done here. 
and I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Um, as I said, the grants that you have at a national lab have to fund everything, your salary, the methanol, and all the people who work for you, right? So how do you get this money? Well, generally speaking, there are three ways. The first is that your management obtains the funding and you don't write the grants, okay? If you hate grant writing, you hate working to find new sources of funding or keep it going, this could be a big advantage. Often the trade-off is you have less or maybe no freedom of research topics. So let me give you an example of this. Sandia does a lot of nuclear weapons research because that was our core fun, fundamental reason for existence. And this is very important work. Some people love it. Some people wouldn't want to ever touch it because they, it's not their thing, right? But the money is typically very easy. You don't have to fight for it at all. Somebody else gets it and you get to do the work, you don't have to think about where the money's coming from. And for some people, that is a really great thing to just not have to worry about it. But you may not have much control over exactly which part of it you work on, right? Okay, a second model is more similar to universities. Let me back up here. I can't seem to back up. Okay, well, we'll look at two. You write all the grants. This gives you complete freedom of research. You can study anything you want. But the funding needs are really significant because you have to fund your own salary plus all the overhead on that, which can be significant. Everyone who works for you, all the methanol and everything else you need. Uh, but if you can find the place to do it, you can do that, right? The different, this is the most similar to universities, except at the university, they pay your salary. So most of my time I've been in box three. You help write group grants. And so the main grant that has supported me throughout my entire career at Sandia typically supports between 10 and 14 principal investigators. We all write the grant together every three years. It's right now it's on the order of six to $7 million in a single grant. And it acts, I would say as a shock absorber. So we collaborate with each other. We come up with ideas together. We execute the research sometimes individually, sometimes together. But in your other grant writing, be outside of this core grant, you may have a good year where two or three grants come through. You may have a bad year where none of them come through. This big group grant can help take up slack when that happens. And that's not often the case at universities. So I would say I've been very fortunate to be in this kind of uh, granting environment there is a great deal of freedom to study the work you want, but not complete, right? It needs to fit within DOE's mission. And if you come tomorrow, I'll tell you about something you were probably surprised is inside DOE's mission, how sugars form without life, but, but it does. All right. Uh, one more key thing, you can look for funding at national laboratories essentially anywhere, National Institutes of Health, all the defense agencies, Army, Air Force, and so on, but not the National Science Foundation or a few other groups like the Petroleum Research Fund. So they restrict to only academic institutions. Um, however, if you have another hat, like through UC Davis, I can apply to the National Science Foundation in the same way that David Nesbitt, who's a NIST employee, can put on his NIST hat when he thinks that's useful, and he can put on his CU Boulder hat when he thinks that's useful. And so he can apply to NSF, but only with the boulder hat on, right? Okay, so, oh, the one last thing I wanna point out, and you folks probably know about this, is national lab employees are not federal government employees. Instead, the Department of Energy contracts with, uh, maybe the battery's running low here, uh, institutions like the University of Chicago or UC Berkeley or Honeywell, in my case, to run the national laboratories on their behalf. And therefore, I'm officially an employee of Honeywell. Why does this make a difference? When the government shuts down, and this may happen to us in about six months, all the NIST employees go home and they're told, don't work, don't use your cell phones, don't do anything, we'll pay you later, trust us. <laughs> But at the National Laboratory, since you're not a direct employee of the federal government, we usually have enough 
money in buckets left over that we can keep operating for a few months and usually Congress gets its act together. So in, in some sense, you may think, oh, I'd, I'd like a paid vacation, but trust me, it's much nicer to know that things are gonna keep uh, rolling ahead in a very normal way and I can keep doing my work and working on everything I need to work on. So you should know that. Uh, none of them are run directly by the federal government. There are, so for those graduate students out there, we have funded internship opportunities uh, to work at national labs. If this makes sense in your PhD program to maybe come spend six months at Argonne National Lab or at Sandia or Lawrence Berkeley, uh, you can apply through this SCGSR program. You can find it online at the Office of Science. Uh, there's a monthly stipend which is really helpful because you'll need to keep your apartment here in Boulder and you'll need to live somewhere else and this stipend helps you be able to do all that. So uh, think about that. You can find information on, on the website. We have our own uh, uh, postdocs in, in my group and one of my colleagues, Krupa Ramasesha. They pay pretty well. We do interesting work with uh, very state-of-the-art equipment. Here's the latest instrument I built, which I won't be talking about here, but it's Time resolve, photo electron, photo ion coincidence. Okay, and my final piece of advice for you, and then we'll get right to uh, uh, questions. To use a baseball analogy, a mistake I think I made at the beginning of my career was to really swing for the fences. I had an idea of what I thought would be the killer experiment that I wanted to do. And I tried to do that for the first couple of years and it never produced anything I could publish. So. My advice would be, as you start your career, get a few small wins, hit some singles, get on base, publish a paper or two. And in doing so, you'll raise your profile a little bit. You'll get invited for a talk or two. You'll meet people, develop more of your network. And then later, swing for the fences and do try to do that home run experiment. Uh, but to start with, get on the map, get on the board, and that will get you out uh, in in the community earlier. So th thanks for that. I'm sorry I went a little over, but I'm happy to stay as long as you want to answer any questions you have.